no matter how motivated, determined, efficient you are, there's times when life gets busy and projects, no matter how inspired or exciting they are, get tricky to finish. Well, let me tell you about the story so far. The far end of our garden, beautiful sun, very exposed. I wanted to have a seating area surrounded by rare, exotic Mediterranean plants. This was possibly gonna be my favorite part of the garden. Baked in sun, this area has to have the toughest, most hardy plants that I grow, but that doesn't mean they don't have to be exciting. And I put the work in, digging a hole in the ground, building a wall around it, raising the whole thing up, and things started to come together. But then, life got very busy. Very busy, indeed. My whole Fire Pit series, all the videos, were filmed in a one week holiday that I had from work. With the help of my neighbour Paul, I got those walls built up, the digging done, everything started to come together. And I really enjoyed the hectic, mad week of filming all these videos, getting digging, making the most of the cool weather in the mornings, and then filming in the glorious sun in the afternoons. It really was an experience. And I absolutely loved the challenge of getting a video filmed every day, putting it out there, hearing your amazing responses, the very helpful feedback. It was just a great experience. But then things started to get busier. And as the baby was on the way, we got the rest of the house finished inside. I say the rest of the house, there's still countless projects as you can imagine, but we got it baby ready as much as we could anyway. And then as the weather started to turn cooler, I managed to get a few precious days outside and I got the walls finished. I got the block work built up with the help of my brother. We got some reinforcing rod put in, concrete poured into the hollow blocks. So the wall was finished. I didn't get it clad. That was never the goal for last year. I didn't manage to get the copings on, but a few months ago, I managed to put them in place so you'll at least get an idea of what the finished product will look like in today's video. It wasn't until this year though that things got really busy. I had so many big plans for the fire pit this year and I had so many big plans for this channel. So many video ideas lined up and I've barely scratched the surface of them, but I've done the best that I can so far. And going forwards, I have made some changes and I will get back to more regular videos, hopefully very soon. What I've realized is, for me personally, so much of my enjoyment and happiness comes from working hard at the things that I'm passionate about. Things like this YouTube channel, things like this garden. I really enjoy putting the work in, but unfortunately work means time. And as a lot of you parents will know, time is something that rapidly disappears when you have a child. You might not realize this, but a lot of my early videos were filmed in the evenings. I edited them late at night, and then I got up early in the morning, often at five or half five, to do all the descriptions, the editing, and finally upload them to YouTube. Partly because I had a slow computer, but partly because it took so much time. That first year though, I managed to get the garden ready for Gardener's World to come in September. I managed to upload and publish 90 videos and I managed to get the whole place starting to feel like the jungle garden that I envisaged in my head. So definitely that year was one of productivity, but that isn't about balance. And when you're a parent, it has to be about balance. You still have the same priorities as before, but there's a nice big one slotting in the top. And being a present and caring father, being a supportive husband and being a member of the family that you should be is far more important than any of those. The only reason that I mention this is someone actually commented on my Instagram a few weeks ago saying they don't know how I do everything, how I manage to upload these videos, how I manage to keep the garden looking amazing and how I manage to be a father as well. The answer is I don't do all those things. It really is hard and you have to learn to juggle the one thing you can't juggle is being a father. You can't juggle being a parent, being a husband. That has to be the number one priority. And what you realize is, out of those precious few hours you left in the week, you have to choose between each thing. So what I've definitely come to learn is I either spend a Saturday working in the garden, actually progressing these projects, or I spend it keep on top of the garden, picking the weeds out. That one very rarely got chosen, believe me, you'll see it in this video or you spend it actually doing something with the family, which obviously has to take a priority when the opportunity comes. And that's what we're trying to do this year. We try to have as many holidays out with the family, spend as much time together as possible, whilst juggling the garden as much as I can, and still putting out videos as regularly as I can do. 
because there's too many old people that have the single regrets of not spending enough time with the family for me to sacrifice, compromise or balance that element. But things do change and later in spring, I managed to free up some time to start progressing the fire pit. I had a few days to myself and I thought, do I film videos now or do I absolutely crack on with my number one mission, getting the plants in the ground? And I'm sorry, it meant no videos, but you can probably guess the one that I chose. Because after all, you can't trust someone who makes YouTube videos about gardening who doesn't have dirty hands. They have to have the experience and that's what I've been doing. I managed to spend a few days out there, firstly getting the earth moved up, building the retaining walls, and then I got some plants in the ground. It only takes one day of being out here to suddenly realize that a project that seemed hopeless at some stages is full of opportunity and optimism again. So I want to share with you what I did in spring. It was definitely a bit of a stop start spring then, but I achieved my main goal of getting the plants in the ground. And I'm so pleased that I did because otherwise I wouldn't have anything to share with you. And now they've had a nice rainy summer to really settle in, which is fantastic. But this video, well, it's not the video that I wanted to make. I had a clear idea in my head, a clear vision, but I can't do that, that's just life. It's not the video you deserve, but it's the one you need right now. So this video is for those of you who have been following this project all the way through, who've been waiting patiently for a sequel. This is my 2023 Fire Pit update. I hope you can see past the weeds, see past the mess. Today's video is more about the plants, but you'll see as we get into it. I hope you enjoy the look of the place, what I'm trying to create, but for you real exotic plant fans, there is one plant in here, one incredibly rare palm that I've decided to give its forever home. I hope you enjoy seeing it. It really is a magnificent palm with so much potential. So let's get started. I was hoping to film this video on a beautiful summer evening with golden sunlight dancing through the garden. That's not today. In fact, those days have been in short supply this summer. And as we pass through this jungle part of the garden, there are pockets of beauty bright colours that do little to tell of the absolute carnage that is to come. But as we push through this last part of Jungle Garden, you'll see there's been a lot of building work going on. Look at the state of this. Well, the fire pit in the distance there, we will be getting up to there very soon. But first, let me tell you about this area. And the main reason for this level change, I don't know if you can see there, but I've dug down about a foot, maybe 400 mil, something like that, is because I don't want to have deep steps leading into the fire pit. I don't want a steep entrance, and ideally, I'm gonna have a graduated slope, sort of leading from here all the way down there. Hopefully, I'll have the same hard landscaping running all the way through, but time, budget, they're all factors deciding what to go for. But anyway, this is the avenue to the fire pit. Not specifically an avenue, that's just a name I'm calling it, so it sounds better in a video. But on this side of the garden here, the sunny side, I've got all my more Mediterranean plants in. At the minute, it looks like a mess. As you can see, there's all kinds of weeds, like axilis there, just poking through. Those weeds, they know where to grow. They know they're safe around the agaves, the other spiky plants, but I will get them eventually. Now, it might seem like a bit of a mess, seeing as we've only been here a few years, but these side cobbles here, I actually only put these down the week before Gardener's World came to film here. They were very much a temporary solution, but ideally, I want to have the same cobbles I'm gonna use for the walls up there, edging this border here and this one here. So that, as an end result, will look a low better, but it's gonna take a bit of time to get to that point. 
and on a more practical note, I've got these two bamboos here, Phyllosakis. Well, these are Oreo sulcata, the Spectabilis there with the green. And then over there, we've got Oreo Corlis, which is a more golden yellow bamboo. Both stunners, but both runners, unintentionally rhyming there. What I need to do with these is to actually put some membrane or root barrier down this side here to stop them encroaching into the path and spreading beyond into my garden further. So it's one of these things where you start off an idea, you roll with it, you keep going further, and before you know it, you've invited a million and one other jobs onto your to-do list, but I'll get there eventually and it will all be worth it. But heading through here, you can see, well, you might remember in my last garden tour, potentially last summer, I actually said about these sedums, or hylotelephiums as they're called now, they're getting a bit big. Potentially the soil's a bit too rich here, maybe they're just in the wrong place, but they're just spreading over, they're blocking out a lot of the palms, the agaves, and overall this border looks so much neater with a bit more bare space. So I did say last year I'm going to take them out. For some reason I never got around to it. They're still in there, but this winter or probably late autumn, I'll be digging these out and moving them further up the garden. So as we head down, you'll see, like I said, carnage. If you're wondering what all this is on my feet there, these are some of the weeds that I've dug up over the past couple of weeks. It's definitely been busy. Here you can see one of the most invasive plants in my garden, Tetrapanax. No, this is actually the cherry tree from next door. With these thick roots that push through, it grows up from them. It's a plant I've had to deal with, to battle with in this area, but we're slowly getting somewhere. See here, my second jubea. More of these hylotelephiums. Might leave some in, but we'll see. This area, like everywhere, is definitely a work in progress, but the priority was to get the slow growing specimen plants in, if you like, the jubea, the trachycarpus there, and just to show you really, that jubea now, it's settling in quite nicely. That's the one that I planted in my video, which was unnecessarily dramatic, both with the music and the physical exertion required. But it's settled in now, it's been in the ground coming up to three years, and that very soon will be fattening up a bit and starting to get taller. The trachycarpus, absolute rockets. I've mentioned in my videos time and time again, if you plant small, a bit of patience the first couple of years, and then they rock it away. The plants will be healthy as a result. So the long-term plan is they're gonna shoot up here, provide a magnificent sort of tall structural centerpiece of the border. The jubeas either side really bring that exotic foliage. Then the hylotelephiums potentially, maybe some of these fasciculares, the festuca glauca grasses, and also the euphorbia there, really adding to that Mediterranean exotic vibe. And up here, this is the Pinus patula, which is a weeping Mexican pine, a real beauty. It's a shame I can't actually show that beauty to its full potential today, but when the sun's shining behind it, whether it's in midsummer or winter, it really does look incredible. And it's great backdrop to some of these feather palms, I love unusual pines in an exotic garden, but I know that's quite a controversial issue, so let me know what you think. But as well as the beauty of it, there's also a practical element. As this sizes up, it'll help to give some kind of overhead protection to the agaves, to these palms here, and the slightly more tender plants in the area. And speaking of which, there is one new addition to this, this Dardilirian here, and I think they are absolutely stunning plants. Just look how fine the leaves are, it really is just one of the most sculptural, structural plants you can grow. Absolutely beautiful. And that plant is a hint of what's to come around the fire pit area. So as we head through, you'll see our old friend, the cement mixer, feeling very lonely this year. It will be used at some point when I don't know. And as we look across here, you'll see an area that I'm yet to really decide on what I'm doing. Those palms have actually come out the ground further on the garden. I more or less planted them because I had a load of seedlings that I grew at our old house. Planted them here to grow them on. Realistically, I might just let these settle in over winter, finish the potting of the soil up, grow them on, and maybe let someone else have them next spring. This bamboo here, this one is moving. And the reason for that is, not because it's underperforming, I've only been here a few years, this is Phyllostachys parfifolia, which is one of the best sort of cold hardy timber bamboos you can grow produces really thick culms eventually. But I've kind of decided that 
A, I want the sunlight from this area here for all these Mediterranean exotic plants on this left hand side. And also this part of the garden, it marks a real step away from the jungle. So to me, I want to have something here, potentially another euphorbia there, like my John Phillips, that would mirror that quite nicely or maybe some gingers or something, to bring some colour in, something that enjoys the sun. So the garden eventually will step down from its taller bamboos through to the mostly lowering and slightly more sparse palms and exotics up here. But before I show you that border here, I'll show you this one. Now, as you can see, like I mentioned, it is a complete mess at the minute. Definitely a work in progress to be kind. Now, the thing that might strike here first off, well, the thing you might notice straight away is the ground. There's loads of bricks in there. And that's because at this point here, I've dug down enough, and these are basically the hard core that's going down that I'll pack some crushed stone, some rubble on top of, squash it down, then I've got the base for whatever hard landscaping I use. But at the minute, I need to get those bricks out of the way, so that's where they're going. Now here, the second thing you might notice, this isn't the agave I had last year. Unfortunately, the agave Salmiana ferox, it perished in the cold winter we had. Now, I know they're not the toughest agave, but equally, I've seen them thriving down south. Unfortunately, up here in North Lincolnshire, with week-long freezes like we had, and also the humidity, even covering over it wasn't enough and it slowly rotted away so instead i've gone for this much tougher and equally beautiful in my opinion if beauty is the word you'd use to describe a massive vicious agave i've gone for this which is yucca gloriosa citrus twist this is one of the plants i saw at linden nurseries last year and i had to buy one for myself it was actually outside all winter potted just sat under a table and it came through without a blemish at all so that's a very tough plant I know it's not an agave, but that's potentially a little part of the garden that I've compromised on. Because ultimately, as great as it is to grow tender plants, I know how busy my life is at the minute. And it's also amazing to have the similar kind of look, but without any of the winter worries. I know I mentioned that enough, but here in my garden, there's some sensible compromises. But there's also some bits where I've gone a little bit crazy. So, onto this side here. Now, the first thing I'll address all these weeds here. If you want to imagine that I'm especially clever, I could tell you that these weeds are actually here to, to keep that soil back, to stop it spilling out. They're a clever method of soil retention <laughs> until I build the wall. But the reality is I have no choice in that. They're gonna come regardless. But those are there until I build the cobble wall there and the cobble wall here. But I need to do that properly. I need to get the footings in. There's a fair bit of building work. And if you've had babies, you will know that getting more than a few hours in one block is quite difficult. And I don't want to start messing around, mixing up cement and mortar and things without actually having the time to do it. So instead, I'll show you this bit of planting here. And you will need to use your imagination. But I think potentially this will be incredibly beautiful. So at the back there, you'll see I've raised the soil up. I haven't quite set the position of those back stones in, but running all the way up this side of the garden, which I'll show you further on, is a retaining wall. I haven't actually mortared the blocks together, the more just placed together, but these stones are there at the top to provide a sort of visual, sort of link with the rest of the garden. It's the same kind of York stone blocks I've used elsewhere. And I think it will really tie it together eventually. The other reason why I've not done it completely permanently at the back there is because when it comes to replacing these fence panels here, which are actually our responsibility to do, I might just go for gravel boards for the sort of bottom half. And that way I could put more soil in, more growing room, and something that won't need sort of maintenance in the future. So that's the back, the structural, the boring bits. Let's get onto the plants. You'll notice I've got three palms quite close together. These are my Trachycarpus Wagnerianus Crosswhip Princeps. So hopefully a relatively compact but tall growing palm with weather resistant, wind resistant, stiff fronds and potentially silvery blue undersides. They're not showing them yet, but I'm excited to see those size up. And in the middle, again, you're gonna have to use the imagination here, I think the steeper or nasella tenuissima grasses, they're definitely a lot more gentle, a lot more flowing. And on a day with a slight breeze, that beautiful evening sun shining behind them, they do look stunning. And I think if you combine that sort of soft flowing movement with the harder structural palms, I think it's gonna be a beautiful mix. And obviously it leaves plenty of room in between for sedums, maybe another agave of there, something like that. 
I think it'd be a really nice mixture of, we'll say varied desert style area planting that combines some of my favorite plants. But as we head further up in this deep dive of this border, before I zoom out and show you the full picture, you'll see there Agavia vatifolia. I've used some of these ice stasis as pretty much summer bedding this year. Now, you may remember, I said that I wasn't gonna have any plants that needed winter protection here. And palms like this here, which is a Camerops humilis serifera, definitely don't. But there is a palm here, my rarest palm, that I've decided to plant out. This here is a Bootyagris, but not just any Bootyagris. Bootyagris, if you don't know, are a hybrid palm. They're essentially a coconut palm for hopefully cooler climates. Hopefully it will survive here, but this one isn't the standard mix between a Sagrus and then a normal Bootia odorata. This one is actually a mix between Romanzofiana, Santa Catarina form, which is essentially the hardiest coconut palm relative you can get, crossed with, get ready for this, Bootia areus patha or areus patha. Now that means it's a cross, it's a hybrid plant. I'm getting a little bit geeky here, but essentially both elements that go into the cross are the hardiest versions possible. So hopefully this will be the toughest coconut style palm you can grow in climates like the UK. So I've given it a really well-drained spot here, raised up. It gets the morning sun, it gets the sun as it passes around all that sky there. So hopefully that will truly be a beauty there. And that one will mirror the palm at this side here my massive Jubutia absolutely perfectly. Both potentially fast growing, both hopefully hardy. These are awesome palms and they really make this end of garden for me. Looking further back, you'll see there another huge specimen palm. That is my Camerops humilis volcano. If I get around this way a bit more, you're about to see it without it going black. That really is a stunner. It's very bushy. I suppose it's kind of like the waggy as Hardy Palms describe it, of Camerops, meaning that it's more compact, very wind resistant. It really is a stunning palm. And this past winter, minus seven, two four weeks of freezes, and they've both come through without any damage at all. But this is the fire pit. There we go, that's the view. Now, as you can see, the walls aren't finished, the floor isn't finished, but I managed to get some planting in this spring. And it really is a shame, it's not a beautiful golden summer evening to really show this off. But I hope in today's video, I can give you a picture of what it looks like now and what's going to come. So, I'll just get right into the middle. In fact, we'll stand here and I'll show you around. Looking back then, you'll see on this side there, we've got the big Djiboutia hybrid palm. We've got another, one of those Yucca Gloriosa citrus twists there. And yes, Yucca Gloriosa are a more common plant, but I think that there with the Shamrops humilis serifera over there behind it, the volcano at the back there, and that young Shamrops humilis there, I think the sort of contrast of the yellow with the green behind it, it really will look stunning there. And here, as soon as I finish this spot, I don't want to put any more gravel in just yet until I've actually built the wall up because otherwise it'll just spill out everywhere. Just ignore that big stone there. I'm potentially going to have an agave avatifolia. Those are pretty large growing agaves. They can get well over a meter across, probably even a meter and a half or so. So there's enough room to it to really thrive there. That's the plan for that side. And as we head round, you'll see it's pretty much a mixture of hardy yuccas some of the toughest, most beautiful yuccas you can grow. And I will do a video soon going through them all, but to show you briefly around today, in fact, let's start at this end here. Let's walk down. So I've got more Festuca Glauca, blue Mexican grass there, just dotting things around. There, we've got a yucca. That one is Torii, which is potentially a thick-leaved yucca that can really grow into something absolutely majestic, something really striking. 
potentially a bit close to that fence there, but I'm gonna leave things and see how they interact. Here, we've got a Yucca linearis or linearifolia, really fine leaves, a proper contrast to that one there. And in the middle, we've got a plant that I've got multiples of at this end of the garden. This is a hybrid yucca. Hybrid seems to be a theme in this area. I just like the exciting potential they bring to a garden. This one is a hybrid between yucca tricluniana and also a yucca linearis galliana, which is a beautiful blue form of this yucca. So essentially, this hybrid yucca here, all you really need to know is it can potentially be an incredibly fast growing yucca that's beautiful, that's got finer leaves, similar to that, but a bit chunkier, but with the stature of a much bigger tree yucca. So that is potentially gonna be a very exciting yucca to grow. I keep using the word potentially because a lot of these crosses just aren't widely available. They've only been made fairly recently. And to me, that's part of the excitement, the reason to grow these plants. And as we pan around, you'll see we've got more Festuca glauca grasses. Here, we've got a yucca filifera australis which is the same kind of plant that Mark's got in his arid bed. This one here is raised up slightly. If I zoom out, by zoom out, I mean if I climb up this mound here, you'll probably be able to tell from the height of that fence panel that we're about maybe three foot raised up here. And when it comes to soil levels, raising things up, that's definitely where the majority of my work has gone this year. Well, in addition to cutting back the brambles from next door. <laughs> But a lot of these plants, the main theme with them is that they need, they enjoy good drainage. You'll have to just ignore the weeds at the base there. I did have a quick weed around this past weekend that took most of a day, but there's some more to be done. But essentially what I've tried to do is grow the kind of plants that thrive in a more desert, arid atmosphere. The plants that don't need additional water and once they're settled in, tough plants that can cope well with dry periods in summer and full exposure. Cold tolerant plants, plants that don't need to worry about. And to give them the best conditions in winter, you really need to give them good drainage. And that's what I've done. Now, as we zoom around a bit more, you'll see I've also gone for some California poppies. Now, I've gone for a couple of varieties, the standard orange one, and there's some of a cream variety mixed around a bit further. They'd look a bit messy right now. I'm open to that. A few weeks ago, they looked spectacular with these beautiful orange blooms against a bright blue sky. Today, with a gray gloom, maybe not quite so exotic. Now, the thing with these, the reason why I've grown them is in this area, I want to have more, I don't want to use the word naturalistic, but I want to be open to plants self-seeding. And I also wanted to go for something on mass. Another thing about these California poppies is they're actually similar to the ice days over there. They actually close up at night. So again, you're not really getting the full display here. But like I said, a bit ago, they looked absolutely stunning. And I'm leaving them in the ground now just till the seed heads start to brown and develop. But what I will be doing is ripping them all out in winter. And that's because although we can get away with this slightly fuller, more sort of flowery, exotic, Mediterranean looking summer, when it's winter time, I really want maximal airflow. Definitely, I don't want to increase the humidity around these yuccas. And that's the way of keeping them growing strongly without blemishes in winter. Good airflow and good drainage. And that's what I've tried to do here. But I think as these California poppies sort of self sow around this area, I think they'll really bring an element of the chaotic to the planting because I didn't want things too formal. If you can say that with potted cactus there, if you can say that with this huge olive tree, and if you can say that with the general sort of square theme of the area. I didn't want the planting to be too sparse or desert-like either. And as you'll see here, I hope I've achieved that balance. Now, that was a planting that was originally in, up that end there. This wall, I actually got finished at the back end last year. I wanted to get the copings on all around early this year. It never happened, I didn't have the time. But there was one evening, I was absolutely sweating. I brought all the stone up that I'm gonna use as the copings. Again, it matches the stone running through the garden. And I've put it in place. You can at least see what things are going to look like. This border here has actually taken the most work to do. I had the retaining slabs at the back there. I put those in probably 2021. But the border itself, this one was really low down. So to give you an idea of the ground level, I'll jump back down again. Where those eucalyptus trees are there, that's about ground level. So if we said somewhere, maybe about that second block there. So when I zoom back out again, you'll see that there's a lot of space in this border. 
And to fill that, I actually used three tons of the horticultural grit and then another ton and a half of sharp sand. So that's what all these plants are grown in. So although all the soil eventually when I finish this border or when I finish the whole area, cosmetically it will look the same. I'm going for this mixture of horticultural grit, sharp sand, and I will have a few key boulders to really break things up. But what you obviously can't see from the surface is that this area here has the best drainage. This border here is south facing, which is why I've gone for some of the most spectacular yuccas here. I've gone for some beautiful agaves, and then I've gone for a bit of companion planting to really break things up. Now, there were a few choices when it came to this area. I could have just gone for maybe three or five of those yuccas there and gone for some really clean white gravel. Everything would look pristine. And I know one of you is a big fan of that top end hotel look, a beautiful glamorous border with these spiky plants really standing proud. But when it came to my garden here, I didn't want to leave too much negative space. And that's because A, I like plants too much, where there's room for a plant, there's going to be a plant, but also because I wanted to really create that desert aesthetic. Something that's a little bit busier, but with a bit of variety and something that looks as much as I can use the phrase, a little bit more naturalistic. I want blurred edges. I want plants self-seeding, growing about. And I want a mixture, a blend of different foliage types. So breaking things down, we've gone for the really sculptural yuccas. At the back there, there's two yucca restrata. They're not the blue swan, those ones, they're a slightly greener form, but those are already settling in well. I actually got those from Linden Nurseries I think last back end of last year a lot of these plants have actually had grown in pots some since we actually moved from the old house so it's definitely more than about time when they actually got planted out but at the back there we've got the restrata at the front we've got a yucca thompsoniana which is superficially very similar hopefully another really tough beautiful cold hardy yucca and i've tried to plant them in a way that isn't too formulaic there's no obvious patterns i do like the groups of three but then I also like the negative space there. So I could have very easily planted another yucca there and it would look completely chaotic. So I've tried to balance the heights and also imagine how things are going to grow. Over there, you'll notice there's plenty of sedums down. In fact, if I look over there, a lot of them are pretty much finished. Some of them are flowering in the early summer. There's a couple of really beautiful yellow types and those are there to really emulate that kind of look when you watch desert documentaries or plant documentaries and you see the deserts bloom and it's just a sea of yellow. To me, that's what the sedums do. They attract the bees, you get all kinds of different hoverflies, wasps, everything really enjoys the flowers. I shouldn't have mentioned wasps there, no one wants to attract wasps to the garden, but you know what I mean, everything loves them. In the middle there, we've got an agave parii, hiding there, another dandelion at the base. It knows where to hide, doesn't it? Those agaves, they don't get completely huge, but I really like the shape of them. And again, this one here, which I'll zoom in and look at now, is agave parii, subspecies parii. Apparently one of the toughest agaves you can grow here. So in this well-drained mix and a south-facing border, which gradually slopes the front, I should have given it the best chance possible. So really, I guess if I broke it down, this is like any border in any garden in the country, anything that's planted up. But instead of trees, I've gone for these yuccas, which will grow relatively quickly and provide tall structural plants that will really give impact. And then instead of shrubs, I've probably gone for the agaves. They're my sort of mid-level planting. And then dotted around, I've got all kinds of different ground covers. I've gone for some aloes. I've gone for these creeping irises, which I actually got from Beth Chateau website. I think those are beautiful. And the thing about sort of desert planting, well, I won't say desert specifically, but if you imagine any kind of dry environment, so that could be a California style, it could be a true desert, it could be even a coastal garden, it could be more Mediterranean. They all have a lot of brown in them. And I wanted to sort of introduce something that emulates that brown color. So these creeping irises, they've actually got a real sort of striking orange midrib to the leaves. They look beautiful. And then further on, I've gone for a brown grass here, which should really look incredible. It's from New Zealand. And that one, as it spills over the edge there, like the steeper tenuissima you saw before, it'll provide a nice sort of contrast to the stiffer, more structural plants behind it. So, as we spin around, you'll see there big palms. 
that border there pretty much once it's planted up it's planted up the same with this one there all i've got to do to finish that area i say that like it's going to be quick <laughs> is build the cobble walls either side put whatever floor i'm actually having there whether it's going to be slabs whether it's going to be some kind of crushed bound gravel something like that and then i can actually finally fill in backfill the cobbles with a free draining we'll say sharp sand and horticultural grit mix then i can get some more planting in the top and hopefully it will look beautiful that area there once your gave has gone in again bar a few sort of sempervivums or hylotelephiums something like that that area is pretty much finished off got a cactus there that will be going in the minute it's guarding the pile of well another pile of weeds that i pulled out but as we head around further you'll see there that is my beautiful yucca linearis or linearifolia the largest one that i've got that is planted there for one reason the setting sun in summer is somewhere over there and when you see this plant with those beautiful thin leaves lit up by the setting sun it really does look spectacular like a living firework it's so beautiful but not just beautiful that plant is tough as well and it deserves its space here in the garden behind it again we've got another one of the hybrid yuccas i told you they're a theme running through those traculianas crossed with yucca linearis galliana so that should be a real beauty and when it came to this border probably my biggest challenge the biggest physical challenge at least was getting all this gravel all this sand up here before the rest of the jungle garden really got growing this year the biggest head challenge was actually thinking about how everything's going to grow and that's because i don't really know how fast these yuccas will grow a lot of them are pretty fast they're faster than you might expect but all these are very vague terms but the general thinking is anything that looks like a yucca rostrata will grow up and grow up reasonably rapidly we'll say a good few inches a year probably faster than that and some like at the back there we've got an alina that's going to be a good bit slower now if i zoom in a bit more you'll see well we'll say it's a bit of an obscure mixture of plants here at the bottom there we've got some sedums i think we got those from a trip down to cornwall they've always lived in the pot with the brahia so this is where they're staying and as you can see there even with all these exotics this is a wildlife garden that is a crucial factor in my thinking behind this here yes i want to have the sculptural desert plants i want to grow but i want more life in the garden i want plants that move with a breeze but i also want life in the insects all the animals and everything that will enjoy this area here here at this end of the garden the sky is big and open we've got all these beautiful swallows at this time of year enjoying the last few weeks of sunshine we've got bats at night we've got dragonflies there's so much insect life and that all starts with the pollinators the smaller insects at the bottom of the food chain and to me plants like these sedums here they really tick that box they're great filler plants they're great companion plants these really big succulents these striking yuccas but also they're great for the wildlife and great for bringing a splash of color as we pop down a bit further i'll tell you a bit more about these plants so here you really have to overlook the weeds all these oxalis especially they grow around the agaves where picking them out is an absolute battle it gets worse than that though this huge darcy lyrian just a week ago that was covered in bindweed and getting that out of here it really is a battle all these leaves are so brutally toothed there they really can just rip into your skin so it definitely took the time to do that that plant there was one of the first ones that went in you might have even seen it last year i wanted to get some plant in to really get a feel of the height that i'll be looking at and the overall appearance of the border so that one's been in and that one is pretty much in normal garden soil there isn't too much grit there it's just a kind of surface dressing at the back there we've got another waggy princeps hybrid hopefully combining the wind resistance of a waggy with those beautiful silver blue undersides of the princeps I need to do a bit more planting around the base out there to put some stones around it and really raise the level of soil because that plant is actually pushing its way out of the ground now i know generally speaking trachycarpus they're not the first plant that comes to mind when you think of a dry arid style garden but this part of the border here is mostly soil underneath it will take a bit more watering to get that one established but my thinking is in the middle of all these slow growing arid mediterranean plants I wanted something that brings a bit of height something tough something that can battle the wind and the elements 
and also just create the effect that this whole border isn't just a row of circular spiky plants. I want something to come up and really give a different contrast to that. This plant here is a Brahea amata, the Mexican blue Hesper palm. Unfortunately, this one, it doesn't look too well. They're not a palm that really tolerates any kind of root disturbance. And this one, it hasn't been transplanted. It's always been, to the best of my knowledge, a pot growing palm. It looked beautiful at our old house, but when we moved it here, potentially what I can imagine is it either got hit hard by that first cold winter, minus six and quite a prolonged freeze, or some of the roots got damaged in the transporting process. I don't really know what, potentially the wind got it, but it lost a few of its lower leaves. I've given it one last chance because this is the perfect area for it. I know it'll get big, but I think I've got the room for it. And these beautiful blue leaves will fit in perfectly with the yuccas. So hopefully this one pulls through. And as much as the temptation's there to splurge and get a brand new shiny plant for the spot, I'm not about that. I really want to give this one the chance to thrive. Like I said, so many of these plants, especially the bigger ones, are plants that we brought from the old house. They've really got a story behind them. So it isn't just a collection of new plants I bought this year. It's a collection of plants I've looked after for years, really coming together, and I'm excited to see it develop. Now, heading through here, I'll show you a bit more of this wall. This is not the standard that I'll be building the wall to at the other end. This is entirely dry stoned and they're put together in a way that we'll say it's eclectic, maybe childlike. I wanted this part of the garden to be a lot rougher and it actually gave me a chance just to play with the stones to know what I'm dealing with. But at the far end, I will be using a mortar, potentially using hydraulic lime, something like that, to actually bond them together to create something that's permeable, lets the water through, but it's also more solid and will last a lot longer. So this side's supposed to look a little bit rough and ready to try to give it that pre-aged look. And again, this here, it took enough time just to get the stones up here, but I quite like the look it's got. And again, I will be having something down here. I haven't really decided yet, but potentially the same flooring that I'm using for the base of the fire pit. And before I take you up there, we'll talk about the fire pit. So as you can see, the walls got finished at the back end last year. The copings are just in place for now, but as soon as summer's finished, I've got those poppies out of the way, I will be sticking those copings down, leveling them up, and really getting the whole thing sort of finalized. When it comes to the actual base here, I've still got a good bit of soil to move out there and take it up close to the house where it can wait until I can get a skip to get rid of it. That is pretty much claggy subsoil. You couldn't grow anything in it. There's a lot of stones in there. That's the only soil that I'll be getting rid of. All the other soil that was dug from here when it was originally a huge crater has gone back into the base of these borders and provided that islander plant in there, or that one there, and some of the planting behind me. As you can see again, this bit here, I dug it out just to have a home for some of this stone and stuff. Because if you've ever done a garden project like this or any garden project, you'll know it's not just a case of creating the finished part of the garden, it's actually managing all the materials and not having the rest of your garden looking like a complete bomb site until it's finished. So it's definitely been a case of, I want to do one task, I need to do three tasks to be able to pull that one off, and then it's gonna create another few jobs afterwards. That's just the nature of the beast. But I'll show you around here. This is the top end of the garden. You see the fence there, which marks the end of the garden. This is about 60 meters now, probably 70 meters away from the house. This strappy plant then, this is a young Nephophia norfii, an incredible red hot poker. This one is really a giant. It can get to five foot tall, maybe even taller. So it's gonna be a similar height that Darcy Lyrian in no time at all. Yes, it's got those amazing orange flowers that most red hot pokers have, but this one is a plant that has fantastic foliage as well. It really emulates an aloe and not just any small low that we can grow here, those giant tree lows that you see in some American desert style gardens, this one's got the same kind of succulent look to the leaves. They really are incredible. And up here, raised up, it really amplify that kind of vibe even further. To carry that theme through, here we've got aloe, or aliompus, or whatever you want to call it these days. That one is striatula. Again, a really tough plant that emulates those bigger tree aloes from hotter climates. So that's the general sort of theme for this area. Yes, they are exotic plants, but they look even more exotic than the plants that we can grow here all year round. Pushing through, you'll see I've got another nephophia there. There's some self-seeded foxgloves, ignore the weed. And there, another Chianocloa rubra, I think it is. This beautiful New Zealand grass. 
that provides a sort of swirly mound of brown colored leaves when it gets bigger, which will really be a beautiful sort of contrast to the striking blues and greens further up. At the back there, you'll see a little bottle brush, a little honey pot, a smaller compact variety just hidden in there. Again, very tough, coat with last winter fine, coped without any additional water in this summer, which isn't really saying that much, but you know what I mean. And then let's talk about eucalyptus. These trees were planted, well, the one on the left there and the one at the back, back in 2020. We first moved in, these were one of the first plants to go into the garden in August time. So they've literally been in the ground now three years. The one on the right there, that's only been in for two years. That was planted out in summer 2021. And I'll tell you a bit more about them. Firstly, I don't think eucalyptus trees are deserving of the bad reputation they've got. There truly is a eucalyptus for every garden. On the left here, we've got a eucalyptus that's great for smaller gardens. Yes, it still gets big, but this beautiful little buffalo here has the most amazing red leaves in spring. The roots are incredible. That new fresh growth is an almost ruby color. Backlit by the sun, it really is the most stunning plant in the garden for a couple of weeks. As you can see, it's getting ready to flower now. And if I show you the base of it there, again, ignore the weeds, that is the catchphrase in this video, you'll see it's already starting to crack and split and grow even fatter. So that's a tree now, which genuinely is a full on tree, just three years after planting it. I'd say it's maybe four and a half meters tall, maybe five meters tall. It's already grown well away. This one here is Eucalyptus neglector which it will definitely be neglected in the the garden, but it enjoys those conditions. This one has huge leaves. I will potentially be coppicing this eucalyptus because the main reason I planted this one here is for the huge juvenile foliage. You can probably see, I'll probably get an idea of how big some of these leaves are. It really is such an unusual looking plant. It's got these beautiful sort of square stems, very angular with a gorgeous sort of red edge into them. And then of course you've got the massive leaves and this is a plant, according to Hardy Eucalyptus, where I got it from, that grows incredibly quickly up to around seven meters or so and then slows down. So it's another good choice if you want a small to medium sized tree, something that gets you that instant impact or quick impact, but then also you can adjust the shape of it. So this one here, if I show you the base, you'll see it's a multi-stem this one and I will potentially be cutting this one back quite hard, but I won't be doing that until March. Maybe this next year, maybe the year after, that's the time to cut them and the growth you get the next summer with these kind of plants, it's ridiculous. They can grow back so quickly. So this one here, the plan is not really for it to be a full on huge tree. I just want the contrast of the leaves. I just love the look of the leaves. Yes, it slows down the wind, but let's be honest, the main reason I grow this, it's not to dry out the ground for the agaves and yuccas over here. It's not to provide an evergreen shelter against cold and wind. It's just because it's a cool tree and I really wanted to grow it. And on that note, I'll show you the other one back here. This one is a tall eucalyptus, mirroring the one that I've got growing up in the jungle end of the garden. This is a eucalyptus glaucescens, and it's a specific form called Gotega. Now, it's a very, very tall, fast-growing eucalyptus, similar to Gunii, but maybe a little bit narrower. I'll show you the base of it to give you an idea. It's already pushing maybe five inches across, and it's a tree, if I show you up there, that tree is, well, it's over six meters tall. So that shows you the growth rate of some of these absolute monsters in just three years. They really are rockets. So this one is definitely not the best tree for a smaller garden. Behind it, I've got my two large cordylines. These were grown for a good few years at our old house in a pot and then planted out here. And that was in, again, August 2020, and they've grown away really well. They were only about a foot and a half, maybe two foot tall. They're now probably seven, pushing eight foot tall. They did get hit a bit by the cold last winter. They're browned off a bit, but they've survived and they're pushing away well now. They're definitely growing up for the sky. And I think they'll provide a perfect backdrop for some of the planting in front. The plant at the back there is a Paulonia, which might look a little bit out of place with this more sparse Mediterranean aesthetic. The big leaves are definitely a contrast, but it was one of the first plants to put in the ground when we moved in here. And I do kind of like the weirdness of it mixed in there. It definitely creates a sort of exotic jungle type vibe, if only in that part of the garden. Across the right there, we've got a Yucca Gloriosa. 
that's a slightly unusual specimen. I think I bought it from Vertigo. It was in a video maybe last year. Yes, the spot it's in right now, it might look a little bit shaded, but of course with these eucalyptus trees, especially this giant here, they will grow up very quickly. They'll lose a lot of these lower branches and leaves and that plant will suddenly have a good bit more sun. It is south facing. And again, because it's grown near the roots of these giants, it will have very little access to moisture. So any tough plants like that yucca there to really thrive. And when it comes to the discussion of tough plants, well, firstly, elephant in the room, you might notice these ratchet straps tied on there to some of that horticultural twine. These two trees, the faster growing two eucalyptus in particular, I had a bit of an issue with in that I did have them staked when they were smaller, but at this end of the garden, the winds, especially during winter, are absolutely ferocious. And they started to lean a fair bit that way into next door's garden, which isn't good. And I know people that have lost eucalyptus and other really fast growing trees due to the wind blowing them and the root system just can't keep up. So what I've done is, it was a bit of a sort of temporary solution. I've ratchet strapped them to there a couple of months ago. The thinking being that during these hotter months when they really put most of their growth on, at least that growth will be more upright. And what I will do as soon as I've decided on the planting in this kind of area here is put in some proper beefy stakes, tie them to those, and then they'll actually be secured a lot more permanently. But that's just there for now to hopefully strengthen and straighten up the new growth that comes through. Now, when it comes to the underplanting here, again, more steep attenuism there. I will add to that with more of these. I know it's called Nasella now, but it's hard to learn the new names, isn't it? Here, we've got Euphorbia. I believe that one's called Glacier Blue. It's a Karakias form. I've got to say, this Euphorbia, like all these kind of white, blue, silvery colored plants, it looks fantastic when the nights get cold. And if you come out at night with a head torch or any kind of torch, really, it absolutely glistens and glows. It looks really kind of ethereal and skeletal. It's a lovely plant. And it's also incredibly tough as well. It took this last winter, no protection, absolutely no problem at all, which is more than can be said for the Butea odorata that was here. Yes, the Butea completely spear pulled. The top half of the plant went mushy like my phoenix and completely fell out. So, well, it had to come out basically. Would it have recovered? I think it's very unlikely. The lesson to be learned is a lesson I should have known before. It was just too small to plant out. So as a result, a first hard winter, Yes, it's got shelter from the north, from these big evergreen eucalyptus trees. Yes, it's got a fence behind it there to slow the wind down, and it should be relatively well drained up here. It was mounded up slightly. Unfortunately, no matter how good your individual microclimate might be, or you might think it is, you're still vulnerable to the extremes of the weather in your location. And I think that's just what happened here. The freezes were just too long and I didn't protect it. Or I just had a bit of fleece, so it just wasn't enough. So instead, what I've decided to do is go even tougher and really lead into the desert aesthetic. And I've gone for these three yucca rostrata. They're the plain greeny sort of blue form. They're not blue swan or anything more unusual. And I think these will grow really quickly to provide a backdrop here that looks incredible. And in a previous video in this series, I remember talking about lighting, saying I'm not a big fan of gimmicky garden lighting with all the different colors and everything like that. It can look a little bit theme parky, if you know what I mean. But I think these here with some, maybe some spotlight shining up at them, they will look stunning. And these are yuccas that will get easily to sort of that height in a good few years. They will really look impressive but I'm not just gonna plant them straight into the ground. Instead, last weekend, this is one of the newest bits I've done, I took out all the weeds in this area here. It really was a field of nettles and dock leaves and everything. And what I've done is took all the weeds out and then I'm gonna build this area up here with sharp sand, with horticultural grit. I'm gonna put some boulders in and have this area as a little bit of a sparse, a sort of desert area. But I probably will introduce some more of those California poppies around here and wherever they want to self seed to really carry that orange color and the aesthetic through. Because orange is a really warm color that contrasts beautifully with these blue cooler tones of the leaves. Now we've got some unexpected plants. Firstly, roses. Now, if you think for rose, you might have an idea, those old fashioned plants that look unhealthy, sticky, definitely not plants that belong in a modern contemporary jungle or exotic garden. Plants like this one here. <laughs> this rose here, 
it's actually a sentimental gift. This is a rose that's been in our family for a lot of years. I'll tell you the full story some other time, but we'll save that for another video. But that is a plant that, yes, it will need more summer water and everything else here, but it had to have a home in the garden. And yes, you could sort of say slightly cynically that I've hidden it up this far end behind this wall that I hastily constructed in one afternoon. <laughs> away from my eyes of people that appreciate an exotic garden. But what I've actually done is, I've grown it under this apple tree here. We wanted to keep the apple tree. It doesn't fit an exotic Mediterranean aesthetic. I'm gonna keep this apple tree a little bit smaller because it's already leaning. And I wanted some roses to firstly lean into the aesthetic of the garden, being a bit more relaxed, and also for the scent. So I've gone for another rose here. This is a David Austin rose, this one here it'll grow up the tree. It's a short climber, Bathsheba, two around three meters tall. So that rose there, it has the same kind of apricotty yellow color that some of my red hot pokers do. So it'll hopefully tie in nicely with those. It'll clamber up the tree and help it look a little bit more relaxed. But over here, I've got some more exciting roses, which definitely fit in with my way of thinking. So here, we've got Rosa Glauca, which is a rose, a wild rose, which actually has single flowers, great for the insects. It produces good hips in autumn, so it's great for the birds. And also, this rose has this amazing sort of purpley colored foliage. So this, I think, will be a nice backdrop to some of these bluer colored yuccas up there including that massive blue swan. But it's also got a great scent for us as well. And on that note, here we've got another beautiful rose. This one here, that particular flower is just falling apart. This is Rosa Morning Mist. It's one of those roses that's just a great doer. It's a far cry from those old, disease-riddled, sparse-looking roses like this one here. That one, I should say, I will have to nurse this one back to full health. It'll be getting some manure this autumn as a nice mulch to lock the moisture in. And hopefully, we'll see it looking better than ever next spring. But this one here, Rosa Morning Mist, it really is a stunner straight out the box. And again, we've got those beautiful single flowers. Not really what you think of when you imagine a rose. It's not a blousy double flower. This one, again, it's more about the insects, more about those hips in autumn, but more importantly, for the people who enjoy the garden at least, it's about the scent. So thinking for this area is, yes, I could have grown a palm here, I could have grown some other exotic, but I want something that's gonna cover up the fence, link in nicely to next door's planted over there, but also just create a sort of engine of scent really. So as you sat in the fire pit area behind us, you can really appreciate not just the sights of summer, but also the smells as well. So this part of the garden here, like I've mentioned, it's pretty much an experiment. We've got the wall there that I built up in a day. It, as you can probably tell that, you can probably guess. And at the top, we've got a lot more gentle sort of colors of flowers. We've got Centrantus ruba, which is red valerian, which unfortunately wasn't the red form, but the pink one. <laughs> so that one might get changed around. And I just wanted to really lean into a slightly more gentle, almost cottage garden aesthetic. I know that's not really my thing, but I think it'll really tie things together. It'll make this apple tree look more at home. And like I mentioned, great for the insects and great for adding scent to the garden too. But as we head through, you'll see it's pretty much back to George's Jungle Garden, exotic planting as you'd expect. We've got that magnificent yucca blue swan there. Very contrasty to next door's wildlife planting. In the middle, we've got more of those California poppies. And this is a great example of where they weren't needed. The actual plant in here is actually a lot more of those Chianacloa rubra, the New Zealand grass. There's some red hot pokers, there's three of those dotted around. I didn't need to put the California poppies here. They look great about six weeks ago, but now they've just gone over, they're too much, and they really take away from the overall aesthetic. So I'll be taking them up from this area before they set seed, and then sprinkling them around the areas where they can do the thing a little bit more. Some more brambles that need to be hacked back there. <laughs> they keep escaping into my garden. On this side, you'll see it's a mixture of more sort of silvery blue foliage, We've got some grasses mixed in with more red hot pokers and a couple of more unusual plants. So where we've got a ringy and agave folian, I think it is, primarily for the fact that it looks like an agave. It keeps that same unusual look to the leaves, spiky, drought tolerant. It's a very easy growing plant somewhere, well drained and sunny like this. And it's got great flowers for the insects as well. Potentially shouldn't have planted it so close to the olive tree, but that's my lesson learned there. 
There we've got some Stachys Byzantia, lamb's ears. That's a very low growing silver leaf plant, which has got, like they always say on TV shows, those leaves that invite you to stroke them. But the main reason I've grown it here is to really have a sort of silvery Mediterranean carpet of tough drought tolerant plants that don't need any additional watering once they're established. But what I've done is try to leave a bit of a path through here so I can walk up this top bit. There's no real purpose or end in sight as such, but more to give access for weeding around plants, messing around, but also so you can see back across the area here. So this is probably the best view of the fire pit. You can get an idea of what it's about. Some bits like this bit here, I didn't really have a specific plan for. I put those rocks in in the last video, and at the time when I left things, it was pretty much just a hilly slope and a few rocks plonked on top. But as that wall got built up, I realised that there's potential there for an almost sort of slate table. I had that big lump of slate. We actually brought that back from the Lake District and it provided the perfect home for a potted plant. And I like the idea of having something like that cactus, which is an Aquino cactus grusonii there for summer. Again, I've kept the weed theme going in the base there. Proper commitment to rewildling, hope you respect it. <laughs> but that cactus is staying there for summer. And then in winter, I might go and have my sort of court end steel bowl there, fill it with water and create a different feature in that way. But it gives me different options. I like playing around, choosing something that suits the area. So that's gone there. I like how that wall there is definitely sort of more tumbled down and certainly very amateurish, but I quite like the look of it. And as those sedums spill over, as other plants like the Centranthus ruba, red relarium, self-seed in the cracks there, it really will look like those gardens, like those walls you see in Cornwall, with just all kinds of beautiful and amazing tough plants growing out of them. But as you look back, you'll really see the full picture. So as you can imagine, all these yuccas around the edge here, they're gonna grow up over time. Some will be a lot quicker growing than others. And like I said, it's a bit of a gamble, a bit of a guess as to which ones that will be. But that's the way I've tried to plant it out. So the end goal is a garden that will make you feel when you're in the patio there, like you're completely surrounded by this huge desert plant, but not in a restrictive, constrictive way. There'll still be plenty of sunlight. A lot of these plants are quite narrow, very structural with really thin leaves, so they won't block out too much of the sun. And that sun will shine right through to this huge palmy backdrop there, with some of those beauties like the Djibutia, the Volcano, that big serifera over there, and hopefully, in a matter of time, the booty agris there will really get going. Might need some winter protection, but I will do everything I can to keep that one growing. Those potentially are a very big palm with a trunk that will fit, well, pretty much just fit in that space there. That has the real potential to be a beauty at the end of the garden. But hopefully now, you can really see the area. Yes, there's a lot of hard landscaping to do, but I hope the plant that I put in this spring has really had the time to settle in nicely, to get the roots down into the ground, the gravel or the sand, and really set themselves up well to be able to take any cold and rain this winter. Who's this come to see us? It's Remy. <gasps> Hello. Hello, good boy. Are you a good boy? Alice has obviously just let him out to come and find me. Remy is my garden dog. He's always by my side when I'm out here. Max prefers to just chill out on the windowsill in the sun, but Remy loves being with me. But here we go, we've got the duo. This is Max, little Max. Hello. Oh, hello, hello. So Remy, we got last May. Remy's now about a year and a half old, coming up to two years old this Christmas. And he is a pesky little puppy, full of energy. He loves running around will chase after anything, and he is all about the food. Max, on the other hand, he is now about five years old. He's a lot smaller, despite his age, and Max is all about the toys. If you've got a ball, Max is your friend. So I like the feeling of adventure of having these little roots through the garden. And as you can probably remember, that little root up there was completely unplanned. I'd actually created this mound in the first place without this olive in mind. This mound was simply the soil that I dug up from here. And I quite like the idea that if you're sat down looking up at plants, it makes them look even taller, even more impressive. And when this was actually being built, this was my main root up with the wheelbarrow. 
and I quite like the idea of having the garden, even though it doesn't go on any further, to give the impression that it does. Somewhere for the kids to run around, obviously the planting's not entirely kid friendly, but that's a subject matter we'll touch on another day. But I like the idea that the garden gives the impression that it carries on. The path, as you notice there, sort of narrows in a little bit to really lean into that perspective. Just, there's weeds everywhere, just ignore the weeds. But as we look around now, I'm roughly in the position where the bench seating will be. If you watch this video this far without seeing the others, then fair play to you. But the general sort of plan for this is, get this soil out here, get the rest of the base down, and then I can decide if I'm gonna use either cobbles, if I'm gonna use some pavers, if I'm gonna use slabs, something like that. I can also then start thinking about cladding the walls. All these breeze block walls are gonna be clad with potentially those split slate sort of jigsaw pieces maybe. And then around the whole thing, about that height there, I'm gonna have some oak sleeper benches, which come out to about there, probably about three sleepers deep. Nice wide benches. And then in the middle, I'm gonna have this movable fire pit bowl maybe one of those core 10 steel ones, but also that's gonna be movable. So you could have deck chairs in here, you can take it all out so you've got more room for people, you can put the barbecue there, you can do whatever. But I just think it'd be a great place to really chill out. You've got the sun in the middle of summer, you've got those beautiful evenings as the sun streams through from that way there, and hopefully you've got a gorgeous mixture of color, amazing plants, and the scent coming from that corner there. So I hope you've enjoyed seeing around seen the progress so far. Yes, it's been a case of a little bit here and there. And a lot of the jobs that I've done are actually been, well, a lot of hard work for things you can't necessarily see. But my goal was to get the plant in this spring and I pretty much 90% managed that. So I really am excited. Yes, it's been a while since an update video, but hopefully this glimpse of the fire pit is just a massive leap in terms of showing you what the final result will be. Yes, you're gonna have to look past that. Yes, you're going to have to look past the weeds. But when you see these plants growing year on year, I think it really looks striking. Definitely something you don't see every day. So thanks as always for watching. Feel free to leave your comments, ideas, constructive criticism, whatever it is, leave it in the comment section below. Thanks to everyone for watching, and I'll see you all in the next video very soon. See you later. I will never forget the first time When I saw you I thought I lost my mind Blue and faded words Blown away and left behind I hope you always be around Even if I fail you are like a summer breeze that I must inhale Is it possible for us to feel this way forever? Loving you has never felt more right